uh, doing business in China. Uh, and I want to first, before I say anything, uh, ask uh, Fred from Panel Gates to come and make some welcoming remarks. Uh, you can do it uh, from there if you'd like, um, because they're the they're the ones that are hosting all this and making this possible. Good evening, everyone. I'm Fred Berkowitz from Panel Gates. A lot of friends here. Good to see you. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, please bear with us on the logistics because this program is going to be more popular than uh, you could imagine, but it's really critical. It's an important topic. Uh, PL Gates is a full service law firm serving the global business community. Uh, we work in the high tech sector, we work in the low tech, low tech sectors, do a lot of work in energy, <laughs> do a lot of work in uh, renewable energy. So we, we work in the business sectors across the board. Uh, one of the most important things to take away about k and Gates tonight, though, is that we have a, a very large global platform. We have offices around the world with seven in Asia, including in Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. I hope we can do some business uh, together. Again, uh, welcome, and I'll turn it back over to Mark. Thanks. Uh, I'd also like to, to thank uh, our other two sponsors, uh, and host uh, Asia Society uh, and uh, is Wendy here from Asia Society? Where are we here? Where are we here? Okay, so good. We have the uh, Asia Society here. Uh, Robert Bullock, uh, who normally helps, uh, uh, has, is, is, has unfortunately got a cold, and uh, uh, and then uh, Chiming Huang from SEC Wireless uh, uh, has also uh, helped uh, make this event possible. And I'm going to turn over to, to Chi Ming um, to introduce herself and our first speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Um, can you hear me now? No. Only three people are going to talk. Already? Okay, nice one. Okay. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so my name is Chi Ming. Uh, I am the uh, chairwoman for Silicon Valley China Wireless Technology Association. And this is the first time we have events uh, hosted in San Francisco. Normally we have events in the South Bay. We are more probably more uh, well known in the South, uh, in South Bay. And again, I, I want to appreciate our event host, um, um, KLG. They are also our annual silver sponsor. And if you guys are interested in be become our sponsor, I have some uh, introduction <laughs> material here. And we can host this kind of event at, at your venue or other venues can do this for you. Um, and then the next, I want to thank our two co-hosts. One is uh, Nightbridge, and Mark has been working on very, very uh, intelligent and, and uh, uh, diligent on this thing. And he himself set up the webcast, you know, how, how technical he is, you know. Really, um, all the thanks, um, my, my appreciation goes to Mark. And then the, se the second co-host is uh, uh, Asia Society. This is the first time we co-host the events with them. Uh, hi, Wendy. And hopefully, in the future, we can have more collaboration with uh, uh, Asia Society uh, in the future. Um, and then after that, I, I, well, I probably have a, a very um, short introduction for Silicon Valley China Wireless Technology Association. We are one of the mainstream um, um, organization in Silicon Valley to bridge China and the U.S. Uh, we promote innovation, entrepreneurship, and also the networking between the two countries. We um, periodically bring in the delegations from China, including government officials, including uh, startup company, big corporation, um, to visit Silicon Valley to understand the culture, to make connection, to build partnership with local government and uh, and the big corporation. So we hope that we can work with um, some of you if you have business need. We also have a local company to go to China. We have a, a lot of partnership there in China. We also have people on the ground in China. We can help you to find the right partner, to find the right office, help to register there in China, register a company, and get a license for internet service. Um, so with all that said, I want to introduce our first uh, um, speaker, which is, you know, we, we're really honored to um, have him with us today. His name is uh, Mr. Xia, Xia Xiang. Uh, and, uh, the, 
So how about you, you, you introduce yourself? Because I look at your, um, I mean, I, 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 you know, I know Xia, uh, Mr. Xiao from um, some local events. He's, uh, I think he came here only like uh, six months or so, very, very short time. But I see him a lot in the events. He's very supportive to the um, local organization, local activity to support bridging China and the U.S. Um, Mr. Xiao. Yeah, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit in the introductions of myself. <coughs> My name is Xia Xia. I'm a commercial consultant in the Chinese consulate in San Francisco, the PRC. I came to the consulate just for one, one year, and there is a three years to go. <coughs> Before I come into the San Francisco, I worked in the Chinese uh, uh, Ministry of Commerce in Beijing, uh, responsible for the, the trade fairs for almost uh, uh, 30 years. <coughs> so that, that's the, uh, the simple introduction of myself. Thank you. What is the long, um, the complicated introduction? I just keep it. Yeah, so Mr. Xia, I think you would like to um, have your speak as not part of, like, ahead of the panel. I'm right? the first one? Yes. You are the first one. <laughs> very, very honored to have you as the first one. I'm so honored to, to, <coughs> to, to, to take the, the to, <coughs> to have the floor for the first one. Uh, dear, dear guests, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> good evening. It's a great pleasure for me to join you for the topics of the Chinese envi uh, environment on introducing a for <coughs> foreign investment. Today, I'm more than happy to share some information and uh, views with you. China now is the number two, <coughs> just after the United States, on attracting foreign investment. Last year, there were two, uh, two, uh, 24,925 companies had got go-aheads for running the business in China with 111.7 billion US dollars of investment. <coughs> Due to the financial crisis uh, uh, for this year, that's uh, in last year, the 2012, that the, <coughs> the number of foreign companies going to China uh, has decreased by 10%, and the inflow of investment went down by 3.7%, compared with the years of 2011. Last year, <coughs> 1,374 U.S. companies with 3.13 billion U.S. dollars of investment found then uh, favorable destinations in China. Up till now, more than 330,000 <coughs> applications for setting up companies in China has been approved by the Chinese authority. With the accumulative foreign <coughs> investment over 1.3 trillion US dollars. <coughs> the 60, the 60 2,396 of U.S. invested projects account for 8.5% 8, 8 of the Chinese total projects and 169.3 billion U.S. dollars of investment account for 13% of the total Chinese foreign investment. U.S. is still the main Okay. <coughs> China has got a big share in the foreign, introducing a foreign investment. Still, China is hungry for more since China is just at the juncture of the restructuring of its economy and undergoing a substantial and a critical stage of the upgrading its industry. The foreign investments on high-tech will be mostly welcomed by Chinese economy with the numerous preferential incentives. China has been sending a message to the world that China will insist on the open door policy and keep consistency with the laws and the regulations <coughs> on inviting foreign investment. China has built a complete structure 
and the, reg <coughs> the laws and the regulations governing the foreign investment, both in central and the local level. But the basic ones are the laws for the <coughs> of the People's Repub Republic of China on foreign a Chinese foreign joint venture, the law of the People's Repub Republic of China on Chinese foreign contractual joint venture, and the law of the People's Republic of China on foreign funded enterprises and the relevant implementing regulations. I have to mention that up to December 1st, 2010, the national treatment in Texas was identical to all the enterprises, both for local and foreign investment. But now, there are 131 <coughs> national economic and technology zones, 88 national high-tech zones, 15 bounded areas, 15 border economic and cooperative zones, 60 export processing zones, 42 other national economic development zones. All these special areas have their respective special incentives for foreign investment. I have to admit that the laws and the regulations are very complicated. But there is uh, updating compilations of all the laws and the regula regulations every year. <coughs> covering foreign investment in different special areas and industries. Of course, it is better to refer to the Chinese Foreign Investment Guideline, in which you can classify what the projects are priorities for development envisaged by and encouraged by the government. In terms of agency administering supervising and facilitating the foreign investment. China has established and consolidated a rather strong governmental and non-governmental networks <coughs> to take care of the foreign investment from top to bottom. They all attach a great importance to the foreign investment and working, working hard to attract foreign investments for the sake of local economic development. Every year, the government leaders, officials from all levels, lead delegations touring overseas for introducing the local investment environment. I notice that the panel questions are mostly <coughs> focusing on how to locate the cooperative partners in China. I personally think it is extremely important to hook on a good partner. If you join hands with a lover, you will be the happiest and a successful person in the world. <coughs> in looking for a good partner, there are many channels you can consider as a go-between. But the most effective matchmakers are the government agencies responsible for, the high, for, the, for <coughs> foreign investment affairs. I really don't know what are the typical pitfalls U.S. companies fail, failing to when dealing with Chinese partners. If you refer to the law firms such as K&L Gates for help before marriage, there will be no <laughs> typical pitfall <coughs> you are for falling to. Here, I have to say, the culture differences sometimes cause the misunderstanding. For some example, the Chinese usually care so much about the saving face. <coughs> They care more about personal working relations instead of regulation. They always prefer indoor conciliation and mediation, even uh, arbitration. <coughs> they don't like to be exposed of mistakes and failures to the public. They don't like to bring the case to a court. 
resorting to the law will be considered as a resorting to weapons. So it is the last choice for Chinese companies to resort to the laws. <coughs> According to the survey in the report by U.S.-China Business Council last October, two-thirds of the U.S. companies in China think their profit exceeded 10 percent in the in the years before last. 75 percent of them express their profit margin is above the average of the world market. 81 percent of them running businesses in China over 10 years. 94 percent of them took the Chinese market as the most important market. Now, there are more and more Chinese companies coming to U.S. for investment opportunities. I will give them the guidelines for abiding by the U.S. laws and the regulations to avoid the pitfalls in the process with the help of the law firms and the consulting firms. I will advise them to work closely <coughs> with their cooperative partners and take more social, local, local social responsibilities. I will tell them that the mutual trust and the benefit are the foundations for the success. That is all for my speech. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I want to uh, agree with Ms. Xia that before you're finding your, um, your lover, you need to find a good lawyer. Um, before Amer and, but also you need to find a good dating service. Mark and me, we provide a good dating service, so you can always uh, find your lover. And if there any, we, we have a, I, I think that Ms. Chan maybe leave earlier, so if you have any question, we can, you can uh, ask Ms. Chan at this time. Yes, we leave earlier, there you go. China import cards, services into China. Can we contact you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to be a bridge between two sides, especially in economic and commercial affairs. Yeah, please. Uh, you do mention about social, social responsibility yeah. and uh, these kind of issues with uh, new Chinese companies. So by that, what do you mean? That means that uh, uh, just a few weeks ago that the Chinese uh, <coughs> issued the guidelines for the Chinese companies invested overseas <coughs> for the, the local responsibility <coughs> because the, the China, uh, the, the, it is very early for Ch Chinese companies to invest in outside. Sometimes they, not, they are not so familiar with the investing environment. They are not so familiar with the, the customs and also the, the social conditions. So the Chinese companies are advised to uh, share the more responsibilities for the, <coughs> the life hold of the local communities. Uh, they, are give, they, are giving, <coughs> they are guided to give more support and the financial uh, <coughs> uh, aid to the local communities for, uh, for, for, for every res respect. Yeah. In, in, in the ability of their uh, com company. Uh, Mr. Sha, uh, very briefly, can you talk a little bit about the Chinese government's effort to protect patents and other intellectual property in China? As Actually, well China's uh, put a great effort on these areas. Every year we have uh, 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 nego ne discussions and negotiations with the U.S. federal government on these subjects. And every year that China have a, have a national-wide <coughs> the conference on uh, cracking down the counterfeit and the, the uh, in, uh, invading of the uh, uh, pa uh, patent <coughs> uh, and the inter intellectual property, property rights. And so we have also some uh, special, a special agencies, which is the China the Patent uh, Bureau, that, uh, who, who are <coughs> strongly uh, responsible for, uh, for, for, in, uh, for, uh, for, for the works in, in these areas. Yeah, I actually have some experience about that. Uh, I have uh, friends, um, they um, 
going back to China and they yeah. set up their um, company in China and then the local government really encourage them to apply for patents there yeah. and try to protect the patent and they actually sometimes get uh, um, subsidized of the patent application fee from the government. Mm -hmm. so that's very good. I used to be in the Chinese, <coughs> in, the, in the Bureau of Fair Trade, responsible for the, the P, IPR with the United States. Uh, the Chinese companies sometimes accused by the US, US companies for uh, <coughs> for copyright uh, uh, <coughs> uh, copyright problems. So we have uh, uh, there's there are, there are some uh, channels we can we can talk to the we can uh, discuss with the uh, <coughs> uh, uh, counterparts of the United States, and uh, there's also. That if you are going to have uh, problems in this in this uh, uh, IPR problems, you can resort to the laws. <coughs> uh, actually, for the last ten years, I was I know that there is Chinese there are a lot of Chinese companies has a win the case <coughs> in, in in this respect. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Uh, sir, is it possible to work with the office, my accelerator, I'm an investor? We want to invite more internationals to the San Francisco Bay Area to do startups. Why not? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, is it possible to work with your office? Because a lot of people come from China for student status, but we want to start promoting them to come under business visa. Okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, we'll uh, uh, we can uh, uh, connect to uh, find our information. Uh, at least from my company, so we can get, get you connected to Mr. Shah. Okay. okay. Okay, I want to thank uh, Mr. Shaw very much for making the time to come here and giving us probably some of the most important uh, insights from the Chinese perspective on uh, how to, you know, how to partner successfully in China. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to uh, uh, continue with the introductions uh, and uh, for the, the rest of the panel and ask uh, ask for them to, to make a few points about. Uh, kind of their view on, on, on partnering in China based on their own experience. Uh, and before I do that, I want to apologize uh, for those here and then the other rooms uh, about the audio. Um, there's a bit of an echo I, I, I heard. Are you still hearing that from us? Yes. OK. It's not so much you can hear it back here. So um, we've turned all the mics out. I, it just sounds like there's maybe another mic getting reverberation. I'm not sure exactly how that's happening. But uh, our apologies. And for those that are online in the webcast, too, um, we have a video camera, a uh, uh, video, we'll video uh, tape this and, and send this to you later. Okay, so the next person I'd like to introduce is uh, Darlene Chu Bryant, uh, who is uh, the executive director of the China SF, uh, which is a uh, uh, part of the city of San Francisco and the Center for Economic Development in San Francisco, public private partnership focused on uh, in, uh, incentivizing trade and investment between China and, and San Francisco. So. Thanks, Mark. And um, I think uh, Council Xiao said so much, I don't know what else I can say. <laughs> but because uh, he covered all the bases. But what I can start with saying is that one, um, inbound investment from China amounted to 8 billion US dollars last year um, as a reference. So you can imagine how much discretionary income there is on a personal private level. Um, that being said, uh, when it comes to uh, doing business in China, I always say, do your research, go back and do fact-finding, meet as many pe uh, people as you can, and then after you start meeting people, get comfortable, then you start considering partnerships. But definitely, if you haven't started dating, you're not getting married. That's what I always say, too. <laughs> um, so why China SF and what are we doing at the table? I mean, basically, we represent the city, and uh, we do help make those connections in China because our focus is to help local enterprises to create more jobs. And we do it inbound and outbound as well. Uh, we do have two offices in China. We have one in Shanghai, one in Beijing, and I'll leave it at that. I won't uh, sell our, ourselves anymore. But um, what I can say is it is important to do fact-finding. It is really important to go back, spend the time, spend the money, meet as many people as you can in China. Um, and the thing is, I will also say that just because they're buying you dinner every single night <laughs> and telling you that they can do this and that, no problem, you better turn around and walk away. 
<laughs> because um, they are trying very hard to lock you down and make money and uh, I'd say meet other partners and do as much research as you can. Uh, in China, what I found that there is there are a lot of resources. Uh, the U.S. Embassy has always been a great partner for us, uh, regardless of whether it's in Shanghai or in Beijing. Um, based on that, they give you a really good introduction of what the current market situation is in China. And then after that, you start meeting the different networks that are in the industry that you are active in. And then from there on, you can branch out and start meeting people and start dating. Um, and with that, I don't know if I want to get into more specifics, but I'm happy to answer questions after the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Darlene. Oh, now, now I hear the echo. Let me try this mic. Is this any better? No. Nope. No. How is this? Better? A lot better? Okay. All right, so we're going to be handing around this mic. Um, uh, so the, the last person uh, to, I think we need to introduce is Christine Lee, uh, who is Senior Vice President of Development at Tapjoy. Uh, I don't know, I've got kids and I've got them on apps and uh, I see, uh, see all these opportunities to get free dollars uh, through the Tapjoy application. So I am familiar with it as a parent, <laughs> um, but I'll let her, uh, and I'm going to hand you this mic since uh, the other ones suck. Hi, um, so I probably have a bit different background than some of the other folks on the panel, being mainly in an operating role. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Tapjoy, uh, we are a privately held company. We've raised about $70 million from investors such as... Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Um, we've raised about $70 million from um, investors such as D.E. Shaw, Interwest, Rowe Ventures, and in 2011, J.P. Morgan Asset Management. And we're focused mainly on the mobile application space. So similar to companies like Google's AdMob or Apple's IAT, we help developers monetize their applications through our ads platform. Um, and, you know, for us, China was an important market in the sense that, you know, you see the growth of mobile devices there and um, we work with a lot of game developers and obviously that industry is very large in Asia. And I think, um, at least from our experience, you know, um, I oversee our Chinese operations, which includes a office in Beijing and Shanghai. We also have offices in Seoul and Korea, as well as Tokyo and Japan, and we just see hyper growth in APAC in general. And our strategy has really been to make sure that, you know, prior to even finding the best partners is making sure we're finding the best employees on the ground to really help us build those offices from the ground up. And we've probably moved slower than we would have liked as we looked at how the market's grown, but um, as a U.S. company that has a lot of different priorities, it's important for us to make sure that we're not, we're mitigating risk while also sort of taking advantage of growth opportunities. So I think, you know, we're very careful about who we bring in as employees, especially the founding teams in those areas, and then also uh, very selective about the folks that we partner with and try to minimize the risk that we enter into with agreements to give us flexibility so we can meet and work with a large variety of partners. Uh, this is okay? All right. I think the closer you are here, uh, the, these are, are not as good and so on. There's probably some, uh, anyway, um, uh, I want to thank the panel uh, for the introductions, Mr. Shaw. Um, uh, I'll give you a quick background on my, uh, myself, my company, and then I will get into, the, uh, into some questions. And I want to, as soon as possible, get it to the audience for Q&A. Um, so uh, I started NetBridge Global two years ago uh, after uh, about 10, 11 years in the corporate world after getting my MBA at Berkeley. 
Uh, mostly with Intel, uh, Intel Corporation, and they're the one that eventually got me over to Shanghai uh, to start a new business group. Then with a, a smaller startup uh, in uh, 2009 and 2011. So uh, I ended up, you know, traveling all around the world doing business development, and I, I kind of landed in China as, a, as the place that it really kind of fit my, I guess you could say, my personality in terms of, of the, the way China do business, and uh, very entrepreneurial, uh, very, you know, results-oriented, easy to work with. Um, you know, it can be difficult to work with, but no difficult than any other culture around the world. Um, so uh, I decided to start this company because, you know, I, I was looking at some point for somebody to help me find the right partners in China. And I hired a consulting firm and wasted a ton of money and got nothing. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I realized it's, it's partnerships, and I realized at the time that partnerships are the key to success. Uh, you can, you know, you can put all this money in there and you can set up all this stuff, but if you don't have the right partner, uh, and as, uh, as Mr. Shaw said, it's not just from the vetting and the legal side and everything, it's, there's cultural uh, and uh, more uh, sub subjective uh, things that you need to understand. And so I set up the company really to help uh, businesses, which I could have used, you know, two years earlier or three years earlier um, to, to help them uh, kind of match make and find those partners uh, and so on. And it's, uh, this is our first event, uh, at least my companies. And it took us a year and a half to kind of develop this. One, to find the right uh, a co-sponsor such as SVC Wireless and Asia Society, um, but also to kind of to kind of uh, you know it takes a while to, when you start a company to what's really the, the the interesting topic, and the fact that we've you know we had about 250 people register for this event um, is 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 just a tantamount to the the, the timeless, timeliness of the subject. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, in in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes is have a discussion around, around partnering in China uh, from a U.S. company perspective. Um, and I'm going um, I'm to ask the first question to, uh, to Fred. And uh, yeah, because I think one of the first people think about is, is on the legal side. Uh, and uh, because it's, you know, you, just like you would in, the, in America, you, you know, do I do a corporation or a partnership or a limited partnership? So what do I do in China? Uh, and so... What has been, I guess, KNL Gates in your experience, and uh, and what types of things would you recommend for those that are having these questions as they're looking to go to China? Well, the, the first issue you have to think about is uh, what is the type of the business, the type of the uh, product, uh, what is the type of transaction that's being considered, because there are uh, there's a uh, catalog of. Uh, industries for uh, guidance for foreign investment and there are a lot of restrictive industries still including the internet media telecom for example online games uh, if you want to want to have a uh, have your game in China you need to use a games uh, publisher so there are also other areas that are very uh, sensitive that can't be uh, directly sold there so the first thing you have to do is really scope out what it is you're selling uh, is it a restricted industry? Do you have to, or do you have to do a joint venture? Do you have to do some more complicated uh, structure? But I mean, at the same time, you're going to be doing your due diligence, as uh, Darlene was alluding to, on your potential partners. And uh, one of the things that uh, Darlene didn't say, but I'll say, is if it sounds too good to be true, it isn't true. <laughs> so uh, I think you really have to be careful with your due diligence, and you really have to. Um, look uh, deep in some cases where the company, where you really don't know the company. Uh, we've even had our lawyers go over to the, uh, the AIC, the, uh, uh, the Administration for Industry and Commerce, and really look at, at papers of companies that say, this is who we are, to make sure they really are. So those, those are the way that you start, but it's in parallel. You've got you to kind of scope out what it is, the, the area is, figure out what may work, what won't work, and at the same time, be doing due diligence on your potential partner. Yeah, that's uh, 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 everything you said is right on uh, in terms of my own uh, personal experience. Um, I, I'll add on, on, on one comment on that. Uh, there are firms that specialize in do, doing due diligence, from law firms to uh, agents that will do that. Um, what I think is interesting, and, and I think Darlene mentioned this, 
Uh, it's something I've learned uh, just over the last six months, first at an SBC wireless event uh, in San Jose, and then with, uh, with additional, just additional meetings that the, the embassy uh, in Shanghai, Beijing, uh, and part of, it's really part of the, uh, the commercial, U.S. Commercial Services Department. They have, in every country, and in China included, a set of, a set of programs that are designed to help U.S. companies uh, do a bunch of things from uh, due diligence, uh, like you, uh, like we're talking about, to uh, you know basic consulting, to helping them set up partners. And what's interesting is that it's really cheap. I mean, it's the, in terms of the, the. I mean, we're talking hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. Um, and so, uh, I would recommend uh, any, uh, anybody that is interested in that I can connect them to it. Um, but it's a, it's a real resource uh, to have. So then the next question I'm gonna ask and then I'm gonna turn it over to the audience because uh, I, I really like to, to give as much time to the audience. So I'm gonna ask uh, Chi Ming this in terms of um, uh, your experience. Um, what are the common pitfalls that you, would, you see people, uh, you've seen other companies fall into that have led them due to a, a partnership gone bad or uh, misjudged? Um, can I now think Beautiful, can I say success, yeah. successful case? How about that? Turn, turn it around and make it positive. Yeah. That's, that's There's good. so many pitfalls there, and, <laughs> um, and, the, and you know, like even very large company, we know that have a hard time doing business in China, like the largest internet company have to pull their business out, out of China. So it's, it's quite challenging environment there, but it's still a lot of companies succeed in China and making a lot of money. Um, so I, I see there's a couple of cases of uh, um, success business. Um, one approach is to marry a local company. Um, for example, Zynga, um, they have a, a game called Draw Something, probably you guys know, and they want to launch it and promote it in China. So they found Tencent, uh, their Tencent, which is the largest China internet company, as uh, their partner. So they launch it through Tencent's current customer base, which is multi million, you know. Uh, uh, people there, uh, the user base, and then uh, just suddenly draw something in China, it becomes so uh, popular and hot game. So that's one of the very successful case, find the right partner with the current user base. The second successful base is married to um, capitals. You you guys probably know there's a company called Evernote, which is a growing star, rising star right now. It's pre-IPO company, but a lot of people using uh, Evernote as their daily working tools. And Evernote um, have been successful get investment from China Broadband Capital, CBC. Um, and China Broadband Capital have a lot of um, relationship and connections in China. So um, through all those um, resources and Evernote have been uh, successful doing business in China and make a lot of, uh, uh, they basically are acting a platform and have a lot of uh, company in China develop on top of their platform. The second part, um, um, successful case. The third one is marry a key leading person like the tab draw. I know that Kristen Lee actually do, have been doing very good job. This is the first time I met Kristen now, but I have heard of tab joy so many times and then in that environment mobile internet in China and US, I see so many events actually hosting uh, in tab joy and then a lot of company come from China, especially in mobile internet industry, talking about TapJoy. So it's become a brand name in the industry. So that's like right person. They they send it to China or hire in China. And with for start company, I also see a successful case. For example, like Charter Booster there, Roy, and you probably you guys don't know it. Um, Charter Booster is also a game platform and star company. 
and that even though the startup they have the right person and then doing the right strategy in China they have making a lot of partners there too so I see those successful case and the other thing is working with a local government um, working with local government sometimes takes time because you get to know different um, organization you get to know who is doing what and but that the, your efforts actually will reward uh, for long run, because we the the local government support will help you to going longer in the doing uh, long term business in China. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, those those are, those are all great examples, and uh, I you know one of the things I, I got to catch myself as being a moderator is to not just jump in with all all of my examples because uh, I I, uh, I want to um, uh, we actually use Evernote note as as a case study for a client. Um, as, a, as a potential successful story. Um, so now what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to the audience uh, for questions. And uh, if you don't have any questions, which I doubt, uh, I, I have uh, my own questions, I can continue. So what I'm going to do is if, if you just raise your hand and I will, uh, just, I'm not going to pass the mic around and I will uh, repeat your question. And if you want a particular panelist or a person to answer it, um, you can direct it or just uh, leave it open to the panel. Yes. Uh, if a company wants to do big data, all right, this is a hot deal nowadays. So which, uh, what kind of companies should one partner with? So the question is if a company uh, wants, uh, it was working with big data, uh, what type of companies? And when you say big data, are you talking about like uh, data warehousing or large? Well, it all involved with data warehousing, but it's involved with a lot of uh, data collection. That's data collection? A tremendous data collection. For, uh, okay, so a lot, a lot of data processing, a lot of data. Okay. Uh, Especially for mobile. For mobile? Okay. So I can, I can answer the question. Um, based on what I see right now, cloud and big data have been getting a lot of support from China government. So one approach you can try to work with a certain development zone, a development area, they provide a, a startup fund. For example, like um, 500k RMB or 1 million RMB free funding. Some of them even not getting any share of your company. They just want to give you an environment and jumpstart funding for you to grow. So you can try to apply those programs. That program running in Shanghai, Beijing, Suzhou, Hangzhou, everywhere they have this kind of program. And then on the commercial wise, big data right now, um, I know all the telcos working on it, like China Telecom, China Mobile, they have research institutes, have a very advanced research in big data and cloud. Um, Baidu, Tencent, and Alibaba are definitely doing in that uh, in that area. If you can connect with them, that's also very good partners. Um, I'm from China Telecom, so maybe I can. <laughs> I would recommend you to think about your service. How, how can bring the value as service to China Telecom, and in order for partner with us, or we or you you help us to you know growing that from big data that technology perspective. So that is one way that how you can you know work with your partner. Think about what is your your technology your service can value to them, and. If you um, really want to talk to China Telecom, there is um, 50 problems in China, but you can talk to their US company that they have a global standard that will help you to engage with the each problem. So the big challenge for work in China is because each um, problem have a, each telecom department have a different, slightly different standard. And that is the way how you, if you work for US subsidiary, that might can bring you that very high level scope and can help you to develop the, your, your product. So, um, you know, maybe this is something I can contribute. If any questions, uh, we can talk offline. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Other questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> no, go ahead. I'll repeat your, your um, So, when you pick uh, a local Chinese partners, what criteria do you you know, you're evaluating 
uh, you know, about the person or about the firm, you know, what the, the things you're looking at, you're trying to, uh, as you uh, make the decision. So the question is, as you're looking to pick a local partner, uh, what kind of criteria do you look at uh, from personal to, uh, to maybe other objective criteria? I can take a stab. Um, you know, one of the partnerships that we announced last year was with one of the Android app stores in China, and um, it was a company called GFAN. And, you know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Android market in China, but it's very fragmented. Unlike Google Play and the App Store here, there's hundreds of different places you can go to find applications. And so for us, what we were really looking at was, you know, can this partner help accelerate our plans to try and penetrate into some of the different app stores? You know, even basic things like the size, the complexity of integration we would have to do, the amount of resources we'd have to commit to be able to make the partnership successful or for us to at least understand more about the market. Um, and I think that um, we also didn't want to immediately partner with the largest app stores because we knew that as a U.S. company, we have a lot of competing priorities and we want to be able to test different initiatives with flexible partners that don't create a lot of risk for both sides. So, you know, outside of also making sure that, you know, there's cultural alignment, obviously you have to find business models that make sense for both parties. I think, you know, oftentimes people don't think about, you know, well, what do I want to get out of this partnership that can help me achieve my longer term goals and strategy and maybe trying to break down the things that they're trying to do into smaller, more manageable initi initiatives with different partners. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, um, one thing I'd, uh, I'd add to what Christine is saying is, uh, and something you brought up, the personal side, uh, and she mentioned it as well as cultural. Um, I think it's uh, uh, the first thing, the first thing I, uh, and, and to echo Fred's first thing, uh, we've had clients come to us because they have all these Chinese companies that, are, that have come to them. So they're, 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 uh, they're very successful in the U.S., uh, you know, they're the number one, two, three, whatever category. Most of our stuff is technology oriented. Uh, and so they have three or four Chinese suitors coming to, uh, to bring them to China. And they're like, we have no idea if they're good or not or, uh, and so on. Uh, and so I think one of the things is, you know, you don't want to necessarily go with your first one because you may fly over there and they were off the red carpet. And the Chinese are very good at making you feel welcome uh, from dinners to meals to, you know, to the meetings themselves. Um, and so you, you know, you don't get too much of the siren song and lured into the fact that it is. You need to kind of, uh, so one of these uh, clients come to us and said, can you help us understand who we should partner with and doing that type of feasibility. Now we can go and do that, you know, we can do a lot of analysis and, you know, and, and based on what market strategy they have, what resources they have. But what was mentioned on the personal side and the cultural side, and Mr. Shaw mentioned this as well, is that you need to go over there, you need to meet the team. And my experience, when I went to China for the first time, I went as a, a typical American executive that just, uh, you know, I'm going to be blunt and direct and tell my Chinese team exactly what I think they should do, and they're going to listen and they're going to do it. And uh, even with partners and, uh, and with my fellow employees and, and fellow partners. And I learned that's just not the way to do it. And part of and I learned part of it is a relationship thing, and uh, so when you're looking at partners, you know is these people you want to do business with that you enjoy being with, you know there's and they have different each company themselves have their own kind of personality, and you want to be able to fit with them. So you need to be going over there a few times, uh, and uh, if you're not opening your own office there, you want to spend time and have enough time with them to feel that you guys are going to be a good match. I was just going to add one tiny point, and that is find out whether or not there is a government official backing that company. That is not always important, but the thing is that uh, in most cases, I have found that a project will proceed if you have an official backing it. <laughs> Food for thought. I, I 
have to uh, get you first. Yes. Sorry, we'll, we'll get you to that next. A lot of us has been talking about the major first two cities in China, like Shanghai and Beijing, which is quite getting quite Americanized in doing business. Now, there's a lot of pay attention within the Chinese government policy on going to the third and the fourth tier cities. What kind of recommendation do you have specifically, not talking about big data, but a lot of people they want to partner in the third, fourth, fifth tier city, which is hundreds of it in China? Anybody? I, 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 okay. Well, um, I, I'll just take a, a crack at it. It's a very good point, and uh, and there's you will have probably a lot more success in open arms and potential investment from a lot of these local because the the government is putting a lot of money there. Um, you know, to have Shanghai get to, to to get behind something and invest in it versus having uh, a smaller city in Jiangsu. Uh, come and do it. Um, you may you you potentially have a greater a greater opportunity to to court that investment and uh, you know uh, deals on on leasing uh, on tax breaks and things like that. So they're try there there are a lot of the pro provincials and local governments trying to uh, draw this type of investment. And so the only caveat with that is 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 this the right place for my company? So if I'm an uh, if I'm a, if I'm a social network or an internet app firm and so on, don't, can I be in you know, a, a tier three city somewhere in Jiangsu that is maybe hard to get to from a major international airport. So that, that's the, the, I mean, that would be some of the considerations you'd look at, but absolutely there's opportunities there and it's, and it's finding someone that can get you networked into that location and it may depend on your industry, uh, the type of business you're doing, but those are the types of things that we, that those of us that do matchmaking uh, help with. Yeah, I just want to add up to that. Um, it depends on your need. If you want to get some government's free money to start your company, the small cities in Zhejiang and Jiangsu province are very good in that. Uh, they give a, a, quite a large amount of a company, in, in, including foreign companies, a startup fund. Mm, but some of the the city was so small, as you said, there's no major airport and there's no major university, and then you may face issue to hiring how to get people to that small village to, <laughs> to do your high tech development. Um, and some other tier two um, cities are more mature with big uh, like infrastructure and also very top tier nice university. That will I, I I can name some of them here. One is in Chengdu, very good city, and still cost is low. And Chongqing recently also uh, doing a lot of uh, things recently. Um, the other uh, two is uh, Hangzhou. Hangzhou is we call it is, uh, the um, heaven in the earth. So it's very nice place. Very good food. Very good weather. And also, um, Zhejiang University is uh, one of the top ten uh, engineer of a uh, university in China. And the other place is Xi'an. Xi'an also have a nice university. Actually, tonight we we have one representative from Xi'an High Tech Industry Park. So if you guys want to go to um, Hangzhou or or Xi'an, you can talk with us. We can help you to think uh, with a local agent or government. Um, yeah, so that's. So, so just uh, add a couple quick points. One is that um, do you need to be headquartered there? Uh, you know, or do you need to want to do business there? In other words, can you have another partner that can maybe help you reach into those local, uh, local uh, cities through their own national network? Um, and the other point is, uh, uh, you, you, you know, we're, we're, we're just getting on board with high-speed rail here in California. You know, China's mastered it, and especially from Shanghai to get in, into Jiangsu and, to Beijing, and from Beijing. I mean, you can get pretty much uh, to a lot of places very quickly at three to 400 kilometers per hour. So. And William, I said you could go next. Yeah. Uh, darling, right? uh, so the question is, on many companies will tell you they have great governmental relationships. How do you verify that they do? <laughs> so the question is, uh, many companies will tell you they have very good governmental relationship how do you really know if they do? Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm 
Okay. Anyway, um, there are ways. I mean, when the way that we've been able to network in China, we actually work through two ways. One is through Ministry of Commerce, MOFCOM, and another way is through the National um, Development Reform Commission. Um, and through those two channels, we've been able to find out who's legit and who's not. That's to put it very simply. Uh, but the thing is that I understand that once you're on the ground, you're in the meeting, and they're introducing to this, oh, this is the secretary of so-and-so, and that's the party secretary, and this is the mayor, and you're going, what's going on? You actually do have to spend time and ask more questions. Um, and then there's a lot of backdoor research that you have to do, unfortunately. So no easy answer to that. Uh, you can. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that you'll you'll find in many of the cities that uh, that people, um, especially on the local side, uh, the local will be uh, will work for the government, the party, this business, this university, so on. So we'll have like maybe five business cards. Um, so uh, I mean, it's 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 uh, it, it's it's very common. So it makes your job a little bit harder. Um, one thing I will do recommend is. Uh, if you know there's going to be a party change, leadership change, wait for the dust to settle before you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you want to take a biotech firm to China, what would be your first step? If you want to take a biotech firm to China, what would be your first step? What industry specifically? Biotechnology. I know biotech, but what area? So. For example, you could go to Zhejiang University and say, hey, this is what I want to do. Can you partner with me? So I don't know if you're talking about incubating through R&D or if you want to actually start a pharmaceutical like manufacturing plant there. That's why my question was, what do you want to do? Both. Yeah. Oh, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you already have... Um have your um, product developed in U.S. already passed? If you're already FDA. doing the R and D in the U.S. And yes. The R and D pretty much done. Yes. And uh, you want to tap into Chinese skills because you have a lot of engineers and scientists there. So and you want to do the development part of the product and continue the research. So how would you go about it? There, there are actually many ways of doing that. Um, there's Beijing Pharma, which is probably the biggest pharmaceutical company in China. They're actually looking for M&A opportunities all the time. Um, you can go to, again, I mentioned earlier the universities. So Tsinghua University, Zhejiang University. Again, depending on which area you're in, right? Um, you can always go and talk to them and say, so is this an area that you'd be interested in? Um, is there a partner that you can introduce me to who's already re are, you know, doing some R&D in this area that we can partner with? So again, you, you have to visit the different universities, the different pharmaceutical companies. Uh, MOFCOM can definitely help. Mr. Xiao will tell you, you know, and China SF, we can also you know, point you in the direction as well. I just say that you would have a, a, a much better opportunity if this is something that will result in an improvement in health uh, in China. If it's something uh, of that nature rather than just an abstract biotech product. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Next, yes. Companies that came up and to claim their patents. Yeah. And, uh, so what, I bet. Yeah, and I know, I know that they ended up settling it out of court. Uh, but what can one do to protect itself, the plan ahead, so that that doesn't happen? Okay, the question is, uh, was uh, referring to the uh, the the company uh, that sued Apple uh, on the iPad trademark on the name, and what companies can do to avoid that happening to them. Well, I, I know Jim very well, so Jim, 
Uh, you know, there may not be anything you can do, uh, but I mean, what you would do if you were, if you're planning ahead and you have the, uh, the resources, um, if it's with respect to a, uh, to a trademark, a brand name, you know, you would want to have an international strategy and to try to get those registered as early as possible. In fact, my colleague Britt over here, I think is going to put on a program on IP protection for SVC wireless. I mean, if it's, if it's patents, you're going to want to do the same thing, but you're always going to want to think practically too. I mean, with brand names, that's different, but if you're doing, if you have patents and you're doing manufacturing, for example, in China, you're going to want to think about how you do that. Do you put all of your eggs in one basket? Do you assemble things in different places? So I think you always want to have a conscious intellectual property legal strategy, but you always want to be thinking practically as well. Oh, we we, uh, we we ask the question a lot, and we we typically there's a three there's essentially three parts to to, to protecting yourself uh, against patent or uh, IP infringement. One is legally, um, and you know do what you can on the legal side. The second is if it's a technology, what can you build into it to make it hard to crack? And sometimes that's impossible. But the third one is, is in people don't think about it as much as the business model. Uh, the business model meaning how, how you sell it, how you brand it, how you, uh, how you go to market, uh, the partners you pick and so on that can be just more difficult to replicate. Uh, and it's a, so we, we, we often call it a three-tier strategy and you need to look at all three areas. You know, it's second if it's a technology a venture. Uh, because you've got to assume that, it's, that if you've got a very good product someone is going to at some point at a, as a matter of time going to try and do something similar uh, and as Mr. Shaw said the, the environment is uh, is changing um, you know you have companies like Huawei Lenovo uh, hire uh, you know that that have uh, have their own uh, technologies that they want to protect their own brands they want to protect Tencent you know when WeChat and Weibo um, so that's that is helping change the environment in there but uh, it's still, you still probably got another 10, 15, 20 years until you get to a point where it's, uh, it's not as uh, tough. Yes. Well, I just wanted to make a comment to that, that we were uh, at General Electric when we were in outside Ch Shanghai, and they have turbine engines that they, they obviously have protection for. So I was just saying that it, when we visited GE, you outside of Shanghai, they uh, have turbine engines in which, even though they have the intellectual property, what they do is they spread out between five or six different manufacturers who help them do different pieces of it, and then they, no one knows the one thing, but they do know that within four or five years that they catch up to the technology, so the important thing is really innovation. Keep innovating for the next the next five years so that when they do catch up, you're moving on to the next thing. Other questions? Okay. Hey, I'm, I'm Sam Wong. I'm visiting from uh, Brussels. I'm a colonel from NATO. However, my family is in the import business. And since 1993, we've been importing wine from Germany, Italy, and now this year, California, from the Kigal Surudi sellers from the Czech London. And so um, we were importing about. Um, around 30,000 bottles a, a, a year, we want to, of course, expand. And um, John Vidal expressed interest in the expanding and actually moving operations or doing a joint venture. So, so I, I'm trying to look out for his interest and not him to burn, and uh, also having a mutual beneficial uh, relationship for the long run. And uh, so, so we've been established but this is the first time I'm actually taking a, another U.S. partner to go to China. Is it, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, the question is, is um, um, well, what, what kind of guarantees uh, I, can, I can give to, to the, um, our partner in, in, in the Napa um, Valley? Because we're, we're, we're a small business. I don't know if you talked about big business and, and the broadband, but um, we were really a mom and pop. Uh, operation with my mom and pop, and also John Fidel is also a, a mom and pop uh, winery. And um, so we're actually using our own capital, and so we, we just want to get 
some some reassurance uh, if we go to China. Let me repeat the question. Uh, so the question is, uh, the question is, uh, uh, he runs an import business and is representing other companies uh, and is uh, looking for what types of guarantees or uh, or assurances that can be given to uh, his uh, partner companies uh, as he takes them to China. There are no guarantees. <laughs> Even if you import the U.S., there are no guarantees, right? But my one recommendation when we know everybody really wants to export to China now is ship only against payment. Just because you get paid for three containers and they say, hey, I need another container right now, I'll be paying COD, don't do that. Okay. Um, so, um, and another thing that I also recommend is never be in charge of distribution in China. You find an importer who will pay you for the cargo, and then after the cargo arrives, you can partner on marketing. But don't ever, I swear, don't ever be the distributor in China because collections is a nightmare in China, especially if you are a foreigner and you don't know China. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. That's uh, interesting because uh, your comment, darling. Because uh, I just attended an event uh, with the uh, U.S. Commerce uh, uh, at the Dominican. Um, I forgot your your name. <coughs> yeah, he's. Uh, I think he's running the MBA program at Dominican uh, at the Dominican University in San Rafael. They had a very uh, very good panel of uh, of real people like you that uh, uh, you know that have businesses 10, 20 years old. Uh, more maybe a little smaller mom pop uh, ish and they're and they're selling them around the world and their most common uh common uh biggest issue is china and uh you know in china is just hard hard to sell to china hard to distribute my product in china and the number one thing they said the reason is is to get paid uh you know they just it's you know you can give them 60 day terms it's impossible and in fact that's something since then um that uh, i've been talking to uh, uh, some some of my colleagues over there about uh, is it possible to create a t trusted distributor program um, with potentially a, a credit uh, insurance gar uh, guarantee uh, partner um, with a d distributor that is highly vetted, you know, uh, and uh, and there's some other pieces in the puzzle. Um, it's something we're just we're we're, we're throwing around as an idea. Yeah. I hate to sound like a plug or an advertisement. I actually uh, represent Allianz. We do have a product that will ensure the accounts receivable. That's in China. So. <laughs> there you go. And um, I will. I can also recommend that if you're working with a bank, work with a bank that may have a branch in China. For example, East West Bank and Wells Fargo. They actually have a branch over there. So if necessary, you can cash that letter of credit right on the spot and make sure the money's coming to your account. So food for thought. Okay, I think we've got time for two more questions. Yes. Uh, Rommel Fox, uh, I do have a shoe brand that's coming out, and we received proposals from Fujian to produce the shoes. Mm -hmm. So can you describe the business climate and capacity in that region, or is there certain other areas that we have to manufacture? So the question is, he's got a, a shoe product uh, uh, that they have, and uh, they have had some uh, proposals from Fujian, pro Fujian product? No, Fujian area. Fujian, Fujian, Fujian area. Yeah. 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 Right. So, so I would say Fujian, actually they have an athletic brand called Peak, P-E-A-K, and um, they're already uh, sub sponsoring one of the NBA teams. Another area, so Fujian, uh, because it's a coastal province, um, big on export and uh, capacity, no problem, but again, it depends on the individual manufacturer you're working with. Um, another area that's big on manufacturing shoes is Dongguan, and that's inside Guangdong province. So I would say if you're working with Fujian and Guangdong, I think you're okay. But visit the factory, make sure you've seen they have a track record, find out who they've been manufacturing and exporting to. Okay. Um, just add to that, the other province is uh, uh, yeah. Zhejiang. Yeah, yeah. Wenzhou, Wenzhou is so Wenzhou famous for shoes. Shoe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, last question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> any, any advice on using online uh, suppliers through Alibaba or any other sources? 
to find manufacturers for your products? Uh, the question is, is uh, using online uh, suppliers or uh, commerce sites like Alibaba, uh, are you talking about suppliers or, or the outlet to no, sell? Manufacturers in China for my products. Finding manufacturers for your China uh, products through some of the e-commerce right, like providers. Like Alibaba. Well, I, Alibaba's um, <clears throat> gold supplier program, people to pay to be in that. So there's a lot of horror stories about people using that as a reference and it doesn't work. So I think you got to be careful because sometimes people don't earn those statuses, they pay for them. <laughs> so again, visit the manufacturer. There's no shortcut to doing business in China, unfortunately. <laughs> So uh, before uh, Mark close the floor, um, I just want to have people know that if you want to do an uh, internet business in China, you do need an ICP license, uh, which is you need to apply from the government. It's a um, government managed uh, all the public website. Um, and it, it, for foreign company, I, I, I know that you do have a very long time, a hard time to apply for that. and. Um, I just want to let you know that we work with Beijing development area. We have incubator there that can help you to apply those licenses, even provide uh, office and some um, in, uh, angel funding. So if you're interested, um, I have uh, a brochures outside at the registry area, you can get it. Thank you. So um, the hardest job of a moderator is to end a popular discussion. Um, but that's something I have to do. you have a comment? <laughs> Uh, actually, China to come America here can help you, and uh, because we provide infrastructure um, in China and also worldwide. Uh, I'm not doing the advertising, but uh, I just want to <laughs> uh, because China Telecom is the uh, largest telecom in China, and um, we gonna launch the uh, the mobile service in here in US probably Q3. The benefit is the um, the you have a one mobile devices, but you're gonna have a dual which is a two, uh, one is a Chinese phone number, one is the uh, US phone number, and on the, uh, the SIM card. So we don't need to bring the two cards. So when you call uh, China, you can call your Chinese phone, which is don't need to charge the roaming fee. And so for people who are doing the business in China, um, you want to save your um, you know, roaming mobile cost, um, Please feel free to contact me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can be the pilot program. Okay, all right, before we leave, oh, you, if you leave, you're not going to get the lucky draw. Okay, we got lucky draw coming up. Um, this is something that's not often done in the U.S., it's done in China. Um, yes, yeah, so has everyone not put their business card in? Uh, we only have one gift, so so if you haven't put it in, put it in now. Uh, speakers can do it too if they want. Um, <laughs> and while you guys are uh, putting the cards in, I'll just... Uh, I want to, uh, if you guys will have additional, you guys will have additional questions, we will be around after the event for a short reception. Um, we will also, obviously, uh, you can send us emails and uh, because you've got our contact information. All right. Uh, so, I, I, again, I'm going to, uh, so, so you can get, any of you have been to China have seen this. It's, it's a, you don't go to an event without a lucky drop, okay? And basically what you do is you put your business card in and then they, they pull out a gift, okay? So. No, I'm going to hold it and you're going to pull it out. Okay. Michael Lappin. There you go. All right. Come on up, Michael. Yes. All right. All right. Congratulations, Michael. 
Yes, thank you. All right. So uh, that's it. And I want to thank again K and L Gates, uh, SVC Wireless Asia Society, for helping us host this. Uh, Christina, who is not in the room, but if she's out there, she was an absolute uh, godsend in terms of helping us handle this event. And thank you for coming. And we will hopefully do more of these in the future and uh, uh, get all your questions answered. Thank you.